Welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to discuss the vestibular system. So let me begin by telling you, uh, giving you a one-line definition of what the vestibular system actually is. So, the vestibular system is one of the human body's sensory systems that is responsible for giving us our sense of balance. It is responsible for giving us the information about the orientation of our head within three-dimensional space, the angle of our head within three-dimensional space. So, uh, let me give you some example phenomena that we will be able to explain by the end of this video. So the first one is, if you are sat upside down, you are aware that you are sat upside down, even if you close your eyes and you have no visual information telling you that you are upside down. So what sort of an example can I come up with for where you'd be sat upside down? Well, I think the only example in my life where I've ever been sat upside down is if you go on one of these fairground rides, and I've only been on one such fairground ride in my life, um, where you sit down in a chair. Uh, the chair obviously has these big straps that come down and fasten you into the chair so that you can't fall out of it. And then the whole thing sort of flips upside down uh, and holds you upside down, probably about 20 metres above the ground. Uh, and it might even spin you around. Now, if you go on one of these things and you close your eyes, which I most definitely did, and I've only been on one of these things once in my life, uh, and when you get up there, at that height of 20 metres, and you close your eyes, you are very much so still aware that you are upside down. You are capable of knowing that your head is upside down, and the rest of your body, obviously, is also upside down. But it's your head that's upside down that you can actually sense through the vestibular system. So that's one of the phenomena that we will be able to explain by the end of this video. How did I, when I was hanging upside down on this awful contraption, uh, know that I was upside down even though I had my eyes closed? Okay, so that's one of the phenomena. Second phenomena that I want to explain is something known as the vestibulo-ocular reflex, and this is really important, and we're going to devote hours later on to explaining exactly how this works, so I might as well introduce it to you now. So the vestibulo-ocular reflex, which is often abbreviated down to the VOR. Okay, so what is the vestibulo-ocular reflex? Well, we can gain some understanding just by looking at the name. So this is a reflex involving the vestibular system and the ocular system, which is the eyes. Okay, and the vestibulo-ocular reflex is all about you fixing your gaze despite your head moving. So let me just draw a little picture here. So let's say we have our little man here, okay? Now, the eyes, the visual system, is very good at collecting visual information provided that the retinal image is constant. It's not very good at collecting visual information for a changing retinal image. Now, what do I mean by this term, retinal image? Well, I mean the light that is falling on the back of the eyes. So this little man at the moment, his eyes, I'll put them here, they are stationary in his head, let's imagine. So he's not moving his eyes at the moment, okay? Uh, and a certain, well, light will be fall, uh, falling on the back of his retina in a certain way. That is what I mean by the retinal image. So he, he is seeing um, the world in front of him here, and the exact way that the light from that world is falling on the back of his retina, that is the retinal image, and that information is continuously going and being processed by his brain. Now, if he was to move his eyes, then the retinal image would change. And for that period where you're actually moving your eyes, the visual system is very poor at collecting the information. So, for instance, try, for instance, moving your head around and reading something at the same time if you, whilst you're moving your eyes. Okay, the important thing is moving your eyes, not just moving your head. So try to read whilst moving your eyes. You will find it very difficult because the visual information that your brain is receiving when the retinal image is uh, in flux, is changing, is very, very poor. So the visual system works very well provided that the retinal image is constant. Okay, so the way the light is falling on the back of the retina is maintained constant. The vestibular ocular reflex is all about maintaining 
the same retinal image despite a movement of the head. So it's about, let's say this little man might move his head. So let's say someone comes up behind him and for some reason turns his head this way. So he's going to turn his head to the left because someone... Uh, to his surprise, he's not aware that this is going to happen. Uh, he didn't intend to move his head this way. Um, someone's going to move his head this way forcefully. What will happen is his eyes will try to maintain the same retinal image by moving relative to the skull. So the skull is going to turn in this direction leftwards. So what's now going to happen is the eyes are going to move within their uh, orbits, the eye sockets in the skull, they're going to move leftward to try and maintain the same retinal image. The eyes within the skull are going to move in this direction. Now, I say that moving in that direction relative to the skull, what of course is trying to what of course we're trying to achieve with this is that the eyes aren't going to move with respect to three-dimensional space. So the idea is the eyes are going to stay constant whilst the skull moves, and then of course. Um, that will mean that relative to the skull, the eyes have moved to the left. And that's going to require contraction of the muscles of the eyes in a certain way in order to move the eyes relative to the skull. Because if you don't change the amount of contraction in the different extraocular muscles, then when the head moves to the right, the eyes will move to the right as well. So the vestibular ocular reflex is all about trying to keep the eyes in the same position despite a movement in the head and it requires a change in the contraction of the different extraocular muscles and we will go through this reflex in so much detail and you can do it on yourself if you move your head around sporadically you'll find as long as you make small movements in your head of course if you make too large movements in your head then it fails because the eyes simply can't move anymore to the left if he moves his head too far round to the right then the eyes can't maintain their same position because they've reached as much as they can move to the left relative to the skull. And we'll talk in more detail about the vestibular ocular reflex later on and the different phases of it and vestibular ocular nystagmus. We'll come on to that. For now, this is just a introduction to it to motivate why we want to discuss the vestibular system at all. So the vestibular system, what's its involvement in here? Well, its involvement is sensing that movement of the head, okay, and saying to the eyes, this is how much you need to turn in the opposite direction to maintain the same retinal image. Okay, so that's the vestibular ocular reflex. Another reflex that the vestibular system is involved in is what's called the vestibulospinal reflex. And for short, the vestibulospinal reflex is abbreviated down to the VSR. Okay, so what's the vestibulospinal reflex? Well, this is a reflex clearly between the vestibular system and the spinal cord. And by the way, the reason uh, we usually make vestibulospinal all one word, whilst we usually make vestibular ocular two words with a dash in between, is because we don't like having the double O that you'd have if you combined vestibulo and ocular together. So usually people do put a dash in between vestibulo and ocular and don't put a dash in between vestibulo vestibular and spinal, but you can see some people putting just vestibular next to ocular. Of course, this is all trivial. Okay, right, so what is the vestibulospinal reflex? Well, again, let's have our little man here. Now, the vestibulospinal reflex is all about maintaining balance in the face of something that is going to um, promote you falling over. So here is this little man standing up. What happens if, again, some horrible person behind him comes over and pushes him, gives him a push? Well, hopefully, as long as the push isn't too big, this man won't fall over. But the push is going to promote him falling over unless certain action is taken to try and steady yourself. And that's what the vestibulospinal reflex is all about. Trying to steady yourself when your balance 
um, is broken in this way. So what will happen is when you start to tilt, when your entire body starts to tilt, and in this case I've drawn the arrows, they were going to tilt forwards. So when the entire body starts to tilt forward, the vestibular system is going to detect that and it's going to say, oh crikey, we're about to fall over, and it will activate contraction of certain muscles all over the body to try and promote you maintaining the standing position. And these muscles are overall collectively referred to as the anti-gravity muscles. They're the muscles that prevent you from falling over. So they're generally muscles that are extensors, particularly in the lower limbs, the extensor muscles of the lower limbs. Now remember what an extensor muscle is. An extensor muscle is a muscle that goes across a joint and which promotes the straightening out of that joint. So for instance, if we take the knee joint uh, and we have, I'll just draw a few little bones here, so we have the femur here, so here is the head of the femur, the neck of the femur, the greater trochanter there, the shaft of the femur, and coming over to the lateral and medial condyle of the femur. And then of course we'll have the tibia and the fibula below. I'll just draw the tibia because that's the main one that articulates with the femur here. So here is the tibia. This joint um, can, you know, rotate. Okay, so you can either have it in the extended position where it's very straight, so you've got the uh, femur and the tibia and they're in the position where they're least close together, or you can have it in the flexed position, which is where the tibia would be bent backwards like this and would be much closer to the femur. So extensor muscles are those that promote the straightening out of the joints, the moving of uh, the femur and the tibia further away from one another. Okay, and this is obviously just one example of a joint here, the joint between the femur and the tibia, but there are loads of analogous joints all over the place. So extensor muscles, they move the bones further away from one another, they extend the joint out. Flexor muscles do the opposite, they move the um, bones closer to one another, they flex the joint. Okay, so the extensor muscles in the legs are clearly the ones that are going to maintain you standing up. So uh, the muscles that extend this particular joint would be the quadricep muscles, majorly. Okay, so the four muscles that make up the quadriceps femoris. So those are examples of anti-gravity muscles. Also the muscles that extend the hip joint, so the joint between the femur and the pelvic bone. Um, those muscles would also be considered anti-gravity muscles. They're muscles that are essential for you to being able to stand up. But there are loads of other muscles that I'm not going to go through. Uh, we will just cluster them all together as these anti-gravity muscles. And that's, for the purposes of our discussion, all we need to know, that these are the muscles that will contract and promote you standing up. So the vestibulospinal reflex is all about detecting that we are likely to fall over and activating these anti-gravity muscles to stabilise ourselves and maintain ourselves standing up. And again, this requires the functioning vestibular system. So, three things there. Our conscious awareness of our position in space, that's one of the things we're going to discuss. And in fact, we're going to discuss this um, in this order. So, conscious awareness, I'll put that as the first example I gave. So, that's the uh, knowing that you're upside down when you are actually upside down the vestibular ocular reflex and the vestibular spinal reflex. And we will go through the mechanisms of these, uh, the neurobiology of it, in this video. Okay, so what do I want to do next? I want to give you an outline of the structure of this video and then we'll begin the major discussion. So, the outline then. We're going to start off by discussing the anatomy of the vestibular system. So we will start by discussing the anatomy of the labyrinth for the inner ear. Um, so we will look at the bony labyrinth, the membranous labyrinth, then we'll turn our attention to the actual vestibular sensory organs or sensory apparatus. So we'll have a look at the otolith organs and we'll have a look at the uh, cristae of the semicircular ducts. Then what we'll talk about is uh, how these are actually going to send information to the central nervous system and how that sen uh, sensory information is going to go up to the cerebral cortex where it's going to uh, be processed and that will lead to our conscious awareness of our orientation of our head within space. 
Then what we'll do is we'll turn our attention to how the vestibular ocular reflex works. We will spend a lot of time discussing the vestibular ocular reflex. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about the vestibular spinal reflex. So that's the outline then for this video. So the first part then is the anatomy of the labyrinth, the anatomy of the inner ear. So all of the apparatus for the vestibular system is contained within the inner ear. It's next to the cochlea. In fact, it's in the same structure as the cochlea, uh, which is responsible for hearing audition. Okay, so what I'm going to do as my first picture then is I'm going to draw a coronal section of the right side of the head where we have taken a section through the petrous portion of the temporal bone. So all of this apparatus is contained within the petrous portion for the temporal bone. So we will look at a picture where we can see the external auditory canal leading into the middle ear cavity and then we'll see uh, the labyrinth next to that. Okay, so here we go. So we're doing this, remember, on the right hand side. So this then is meant to represent the uh, right external auditory canal here. And it'll come down like so. Right, and then up like this. And this is it becoming the middle ear cavity here. So this portion is the external auditory canal. So I'll just um, enable this up. So this is the external auditory canal. And of course, you can put your finger into your external auditory canal because it opens out as the external auditory meatus. So this is the external auditory canal. And then there is a junction between the external auditory canal and the middle ear cavity that is demarcated by the tympanic membrane here. Okay, or the eardrum. So this is representing the tympanic membrane and this marks the end of the external auditory canal and the beginning of the middle ear cavity, so the tympanic membrane. So we'll add a little bit of colour onto this. So we'll have the tympanic membrane shown here in blue. Okay, so now what we're entering then, I'll underline the tympanic membrane label in blue, uh, we are now entering the middle ear cavity. And the middle ear cavity is where the ossicles that are going to take part in auditory transduction are going to be. For the basis of the picture being complete, I'm going to add these on here. However, of course, we're not interested in these. These are very important in the auditory system, but we're discussing the vestibular system. So here is the middle ear cavity. Here's the eustachian tube down here. And the middle ear cavity has this strange shape. Like so, and remember, all of this is located inside the petrous portion of the temporal bone. Okay, so it's all surrounded by bone. In this area, this area here, this is all bone. So I'll label this up. This is the eustachian tube, which connects uh, the middle ear cavity with the uh, nasopharynx and allows the equalization of the pressure within the middle ear cavity to atmospheric pressure. And this prevents um, the potential rupturing of the tympanic membrane that would occur if we weren't able to um, equalize the pressure in the middle ear cavity with uh, the external atmospheric pressure, because then you'd have a pressure difference across the tympanic membrane. Okay, so before I go any further and actually draw the structure that we're interested in, which is the inner ear, I'll just label this up as the middle ear cavity. Oh, and I said I was going to put the ossicles in, so I'll do that as well. So this is the middle ear cavity here. So now there is the ossicular chain which connects the tympanic membrane to the uh, inner ear, also known as the labyrinth. So the ossicular chain consists of three tiny little bones known as the ossicles. The first one is called the malleus, which uh, is named so because malleus in some old language uh, means uh, hammer. And I'm just wondering where to put the uh, our, uh, the words because I need this space kept clear for the labyrinth. So I'll put the um, names of the ossicles up here. So they're all known as the ossicles. And the first one that I've drawn in here is the malleus. So we've got the two main portions of the malleus shown here. This is the handle of the malleus attached to the tympanic membrane. And then we've got the head of the malleus here, which is going to articulate with the next uh, ossicle along. So the next ossicle along is known as the incus. 
and the incus looks like this. Okay, you have the body of the incus up here, which is articulating with the head of the malleus. Then you have a portion, whoops, I've underlined the wrong one in orange, so the malleus should be underlined in orange. I will now re-underline incus in pink here, and I'll colour in the pink. So this, uh, the, this portion here that is articulating with the malleus, this is known as the body of the incus. Then we've got this process that comes down, and this is known as the long crus of the incus. So that's called the long, and I'm putting this in exactly the place where I don't want it. Okay, I'll try and keep as much space clear. So that's the long crust down here, and then that little bit that comes off the long crust the other way, that's known as the lenticular process of the incus. So this is the lenticular process. Okay. And then finally, the third ossicle along is then the stapes. And the stapes is best viewed from a different angle to the angle that I'm drawing this picture at. So remember, I am looking from the anterior aspect when we see this picture here. And that's not the best angle to see the stapes from. The best angle to see the stapes from is from above. From the angle that we're looking at, the stapes would look rather like this. Okay, if I was to look from above, I'd see something rather more interesting. I'd see something like this. So from above, here would be the portion that's uh, articulating with the um, lenticular process of the incus here, the head of the stapes. Then what you'd have is these two processes coming off like this, one known as the anterior crust and one known as the posterior crust. So here's the head. This one that's anteriorly, remember we're looking from a Above. So this one's further forward, this is the anterior crust. This one at the back, this is known as the posterior crust. And then this portion here, this is the foot plate of the stapes. And this is inserted into uh, a portion of the uh, inner ear, the labyrinth, known as the oval window. And this is the way the oscillations in the uh, ossicular chain is actually going to be transmitted into the inner ear. Okay, so I'll just colour in the stapes here in green. Okay, so overall, uh, this is part of the auditory system, but just so that you've got a little bit of an understanding here, when the tympanic membrane oscillates, the stipe, uh, sorry, the ossicular chain will oscillate, and it will cause oscillations inside of the uh, labyrinth, uh, which will cause a transduction by the cochlear portion of the labyrinth. So, now to actually look at the portion that we actually need to understand. All of this was just to put it in context. And the portion that we need to understand is the inner ear, which is more commonly referred to as the labyrinth. Okay, and this is the portion that looks a little bit like a snail, at least the cochlear portion does. So, we will start by drawing the cochlear portion, because that's the easier part to start with. So the cochlear portion, remember, consists of a canal known as the spiral canal that is wrapped around a central portion of bone, a central cone of bone, known as the modulus. So from the front, it's going to look like so. So here's the beginning of this spiral canal, and it goes back and round. Okay, so this is right at the front, then we're going further backwards, it's going round and round, and at the centre there is a cone uh, of bone. So I'll just draw this cone of bone. So there's a cone of bone with this spiral canal going round. So if we drew it in cross section, it would look like this. So here's this portion, this tube in cross section, and then you've got another tube there, another tube there, another tube there, as it spirals around. So this is what it would look like if I took a uh, transverse cross section through this. So this cone of bone at the centre, this is known as the modulus, and then wrapped around it is a tube uh, known as the spiral canal, because of course uh, it is in a spiral. Right, uh, so continuing the picture on, how many uh, times then does the spiral canal wrap around the modulus uh, to form the cochlea? Well, it's approximately two and a half times, so we've gone round one time so far, so we need another time, and then another half. So here it's going round, and then it's going to come up here, and then it's going to end here, the cochlea, and then behind what we're going to have is the uh, start of the vestibular system. So here, 
this is roughly uh, where the cochlear ends, at about this portion where the stapes is attaching in, although the stapes actually attaches into a bit that's part, really, of the vestibular portion of the um, labyrinth, which I'll explain in a, port in a moment. So the cochlear ends around this portion here. Okay, right, so that's the cochlear portion of the labyrinth. Now let's go up and have a look at the portions up here. So above the cochlea, you then have a portion that's known as the vestibule. Okay, and at the moment we're just looking at the bony labyrinth. So you can divide the labyrinth into two different portions. The bony labyrinth, which is the outer shell of it. So we've been talking about that, we've been talking about this cone of bone here around which the spiral canal is uh, wrapped, that's bone. We've also been talking about the spiral canal, which is this tube encased in bone. So it's a bony tube at the moment. So that's all bone, so that's why this is known as the bony labyrinth. But inside the bone, what we're going to have is other tubes running, which will be made out of membranes. And that's known as the membranous labyrinth, rather than the bony labyrinth. So we can separate the labyrinth into these two different portions, the bony labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth. And at the moment, we are talking about the bony labyrinth. So what have we studied so far? We've studied the bony cochlea. We've studied the modulus with the spiral canal wrapped around it. And all of that is just a bony shell. So that's the bony cochlea. Now the next portion up here, which is continuous with the cochlea effectively, um, is more bone. And it's a space known as the vestibule, the bony vestibule. And now coming off the bony vestibule, we're going to have these semicircular canals. So this is a key term, semicircular canals. And for short, the semicircular canals are abbreviated down to the SCCs. Okay, so you have three semicircular canals on each side, and I should say that you will have the identical thing, uh, well, the mirror image of this, on the um, left-hand side as well. So you'll have two uh, vestibular systems, um, one on each side, or vestibular apparatuses, I should say. So now, the semicircular canals. So two of them are connected to one another, which are the anterior and posterior ones. So I'll give you the names of the three semicircular canals. So there is an anterior semicircular canal, there is a posterior semicircular canal, and there is a horizontal semicircular canal. Now, some of these can have different names. So, for instance, the anterior semicircular canal, that can also be called the superior semicircular canal, and the horizontal semicircular canal, that can also be called the lateral semicircular canal. However, these are the three main names that you'll find people using, so those are the names we're going to be using throughout here. Okay, so let me show you this then. So, here is the common connection. I'm going to start by drawing the common connection between the um, anterior and inferior, sorry, anterior and posterior semicircular canals. Okay, so it'll come round like so, and draw this here. And you're also going to have another one coming off here. So this is the common connection between the anterior and posterior. So they're both coming off here. This is going to be the anterior one, and this is going to be the posterior one. So let me complete the anterior one first. So here comes the anterior one coming down here. And they've got this sort of expansion just before they join uh, the um, vestibule here. So to orient you, this will be further back than this portion, and it's looping forwards at this sort of angle that's approximately 45 degrees from the sagittal plane. So if we were looking from above, this is what um, the angles would look like. So if we were looking from above, let's say this is the sagittal plane, this can, dot here can represent this bit coming up, and then this loop round here, which is the anterior semicircular canal, so all of this is the anterior semicircular canal, this will be coming at an angle like so, forwards. So this is the front, this is the back, it's coming at an angle like this, and it's coming forward and attaching onto the vestibule here. And that expansion at the bottom, just before it attaches onto the vestibule, is known as the ampulla. The plural is ampullae. All of the semicircular canals are going to have ampullae. So let me um, colour this in. So this is the anterior semicircular canal. Here it is. There's its ampulla, and it's going back all the way here. Let's now complete up uh, the... Well, actually, no. We'll leave the posterior semicircular canal for now. I want to put on the horizontal 
one onto my picture before I um, complete the posterior semicircular canal. So here comes the um, horizontal semicircular canal. So here is its ampulla, and then we're going to go sort of horizontally. So it's named reasonably well. It is horizontal. It's in the horizontal plane. So here's the ampulla connecting onto the vestibule, and then it goes backwards in the horizontal plane, and it's connecting onto the vestibule further back. Okay, so this is the tube here, the semicircular canal, going between the vestibule. And note that only one of the connections has an ampulla, the anterior connection in both the cases of the anterior and the horizontal semicircular canal. So here's the horizontal semicircular canal's uh, ampulla in this case. Okay, right, so now I've done that, and I'll just colour this one in, so we'll have it in pink here. There's the horizontal semicircular canal. And then finally, let's complete up the posterior semicircular canal. So down it will come like so. So here is it continuing. It's going behind the anterior semicircular canal here. And then it will connect at the back here. And here is its ampulla shown here. OK, and they're all connecting onto the uh, vestibule. And if you want to know what angle the posterior semicircular canal is at, it's sort of at 45 degrees from the sagittal plane, but going backwards. So again, here is the common um, insertion of both the anterior and posterior semicircular canals. And here is the posterior semicircular canal going backwards. And it's going backwards at an angle of 45 degrees. And here will be its ampulla where it's connecting onto the uh, vestibule again. So here's the ampulla of the anterior. Here's the ampulla of the posterior. OK, so that's the posterior semicircular canal. So that's the anatomy, then, of the uh, semicircular canals. And these, remember, are bony structures, hollow bony structures. So at the moment, we're just talking about the bony uh, labyrinth. So these are the three different portions, then, of the bony labyrinth. There is the cochlea, consisting of the modulus and spiral canal around it. The vestibule, which is this portion here. It's the continuation, if you like, of the spiral canal. And then the semicircular canal is coming off. These are the bony vestibular portions. This is the bony cochlear portion, which is part of the auditory system. So the labyrinth has these two different portions. OK, the part to do with audition and the part to do with vestibular sensation. Now let's talk about the membranous labyrinth. So before I go any further, let me say that this bony hollow structure, this bony labyrinth, is filled with a fluid. Okay, and this fluid is known as perilymph. So all of this hollow space, so the spiral canal was a hollow space, all of this space here, okay, uh, all of the space within the vestibule, bony vestibule, and all of the space within the semicircular canals, it's filled with a fluid called perilymph. And perilymph is kind of your typical extracellular fluid. It has a very high sodium concentration and a very low potassium concentration, which is normal for extracellular fluids. So high sodium concentration and low potassium concentration, i.e. the normal electrolyte composition, or the major two electrolytes at least, for an extracellular fluid. So it's filled with this perilymph, which is a fluid containing the normal composition of sodium and potassium ions. OK, now let me begin the discussion of the membranous labyrinth. So this is fantastic. It's very simple. It's a bony structure filled with fluid at the moment. But of course, that's not going to do anything. It's just bone at the moment. So the portion that is actually going to contain the sensory organs is the membranous labyrinth. So inside the bony labyrinth, there are other tubes where the walls of these tubes are made up by biological membranes rather than bone, i.e. they're much more fragile. So I'll start by putting in the membranous portion of the cochlea, and I'll colour in these membranous portions in blue. So throughout the cochlea then, or throughout the spiral canal of the cochlea, there is a tube, and that's what I'm showing now here in blue. So here is the membrane-bound tube that is wrapping around inside the spiral canal here. And it's going to get gradually larger as we get to these larger portions of the spiral canal here, and it will come all the way up here, like so. OK, and this is what's called the cochlear duct. So that bit in blue there, that's the membranous portion of the cochlea, and it's called the cochlear duct. 
Okay, so it's a membrane-bound cavity which contains a different type of fluid. So it's a tube which is hollow again. The walls of that tube are made up by a membrane, and inside there you have a different type of fluid which is known as endolymph. So you're now starting to get it, hopefully, around the outside of this membranous tube. Within the bony tube, we have the perilymph. Peri means around, so it's the lymph that is around the membranous tube. And then inside the tube, the membranous tube, not the bony tube, inside the membranous tube, we have a different type of fluid known as endolymph. Endo means inside. And endolymph is very strange extracellular fluid, because remember, this is still extracellular fluid. This isn't a cell we're talking about here. This is a big tube. It has a very, very low sodium concentration. So a very low sodium concentration, but a very high potassium concentration. That is more usual for an intracellular fluid. So it's a pretty much unique extracellular fluid to find within the body. And this is actually important for the way that the sensory organs uh, work, of the uh, vestibular system and indeed of the auditory system, which is the portion that we've looked at so far. Okay, so... That's the cochlear duct, the tube that is within the bony cochlear. Now let's continue it on and have a look at the um, tubes, the membranous portions of the vestibular system. So up here what we're going to have is two membrane-bound structures, bags if you like, which are known as the otolith organs. So I'll draw these on here. So one is in this sort of position here within the bony vestibule and then one's just underneath the uh, semicircular canals there. So these two structures, they're membrane bound bags if you like and they are known as the otolith organs and they're going to contain parts of the vestibular sensory system and we'll have a look at those vestibular sensory systems later on. At the moment just know that they are membrane bound bags of endolymph and they are part of the uh, membranous labyrinth. Okay so they the two of these have different names. One is called the saccule, and the other is called the utricle. So which one's which? The one here, this is the saccule, and this one just below the semicircular canals, this is the utricle. Okay, so we've got these two membrane-bound bags of endolymph, and of course they're all going to be connected together. So there is a little connection between the cochlear duct and the first of these otolith organs, which is the saccule, uh, and that connection between the cochlear duct and the uh, saccule, that is known as the ductus reunions of Henson. So often people just call this the ductus reunions. If you're trying to be really fancy, you can add on of Henson. So the ductus reunions of Henson, that's the name for the little connection uh, between the cochlear duct and the uh, saccule, and this means that the two are continuous. Okay, so the fluid inside the saccule is the same as the fluid inside uh, the cochlear duct, endolymph. Then there is a little connection between the saccule and the utricle there, which is sensibly called, more sensibly named than this, easier to remember, something you'd be able to guess if you forget. It's known as the utriculo saccular duct. So perfectly sensible, it's connecting the utricle and the saccule, so we've called it the utriculo saccular duct. Okay, so there's a connection between the utricle and the saccule. Okay, so we're, this is very nice. The entire membranous labyrinth is all connected together. And now finally, there's going to be membranous tubes inside the semicircular canal. So let me add these on. So here we go. So it put inside all of the semicircular canals, membranous ducts, and they will expand at the ampullae, so you'll have ampullae of the membranous ducts as well. So here we go. There's the posterior one, and here is the um, horizontal one. So inside all of the semicircular canals, which are the bony tubes, there are membranous tubes, and these are known as the semicircular ducts. Whoops. Semi semicircular ducts. So that's the difference between the semicircular canals and the semicircular ducts. The semicircular canals are the bony tubes. The semicircular ducts are the membranous tubes that mirror. They have the same shape as the semicircular canals, i.e. they have the ampullae at the same points as the semicircular canals have ampullae, uh, but they are bounded by membranes and inside them they have endolymph. Okay, so that then is the membranous labyrinth sitting inside at the bony labyrinth. So, just to go over everything, 
you have the bony labyrinth, which is this bone structure, which contains this fluid called perilymph. Inside there, floating inside of there, there is a membrane-bound structure, which is this membranous labyrinth, which consists of all these different portions. There is the great big cochlear duct here, which is membrane-bound and contains endolymph. It's connected then to the saccule by the ductus reunions of Henson here, um, and this again is a part of the membranous labyrinth, you then have a connection between the saccule and the utricle, um, which is known as the utriculosaccular duct, and then off the utricle, I should have said this actually, off the utricle come all of the semicircular ducts which are sitting within the semicircular canals. Okay, so this is the vestibular portion, the saccule, the utricle, and the semicircular ducts. The cochlear duct is the auditory portion. So just to complete your little insight into the auditory system, the ossicular chain is going to um, oscillate when sound occurs, which will oscillate the tympanic membrane. And the stapes here, the foot plate of the stapes, sits in a little window known as the oval window. So there is a hole in the uh, bone of the labyrinth known as the oval window, which is covered by a membrane. And the stapes sits in here and will press in and out of that oval window and compress and um, well compress and uncompress the perilymph of the labyrinth here, and that's actually going to lead to vibrations of the cochlear duct, and that will transduce the information about auditory stimuli into electrical stimuli, which can be interpreted by the brain. But no more of the auditory system. We're going to cut a, you know, cross this bit off now, and we're just going to focus on this portion of the story, because this is the vestibular portion of the labyrinth, the otolith organs and the semicircular ducts. So there's the first video complete. This has gone over the anatomy of the labyrinth. In the next video, what we will start to look at is the sensory apparatus, which is inside of these uh, labyrinth vestibular structures here, so inside of the utricle and the saccules and the semicircular ducts. Okay, so we'll see you in the next video.